So we've been on this series uh, called Turning Point from the book of 1 Samuel. A few weeks ago when I was last here, I heard James preach about the call of Samuel, who became the great prophet, really the last great prophet of Israel. Because last week Chad told us that Israel did one of the most stupid things that they'd ever done in the history of stupid stuff. And that was that Israel was a theocracy, that God was their king. He knew them, he led them, he provided for them, he protected them, and he spoke to them personally. It was unique in the whole world. And yet, for them, it wasn't enough. They wanted to be like all the other people around them. There's our first clue. That's a dumb thing to ask for. As a Christian, do not strive to be like all the other people around you. When you have a good thing with God, press in on it. And don't say, God, can you just let me be like everybody else? But he gave them a king. And Samuel was heartbroken, as we heard last week. He said, God, they're rejecting me as the prophet. And the Lord said, no, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me as their king. And so he gave them the king. He gave them a warning. And the king came and his name was Saul. And it started out okay, but it went from bad to worse. And now Saul was in a place that he was tormented by an evil spirit. Such was his relationship with God so broken. And the only thing that helped him is when a young boy who was a musician, a worship leader, and a songwriter, a shepherd boy called David, would come and sing worship and praise and play his guitar. And the spirit would leave him and a spirit of peace and calm would come. There's our second lesson for the day. When you need peace, what do you do? You worship. You can worship your way out of trouble. As well as serving Saul, this young boy David had a new call in his life. Because in the rejection of Saul, God says, I'm going to give you another king. And he said to Samuel, okay, your job's not quite done yet. You're going to help me discover, find and anoint the next king. The one who's going to replace Saul, whom I'm rejecting. And so he took him to the house of Jesse. And Jesse had eight sons. Kind of a bit like uh, Rachel and Laverne, only doubled. (laughs) And they were all boys, and they went down in steps and stairs. And Samuel turned up, and the first guy standing there, he was big, and he was tall, just like Laverne, and handsome. (laughs) But God said, no, it's not him. And then he went through son after son after son. And it reminds me, back in Scotland, where I went to school, I, I was a soccer player. And at lunchtime, we always played soccer games. And so myself and one other guy, we'd be the two captains, and we'd line up all the boys, and we got to choose who was on our team. And you always pick the good ones, and then you get the two little guys at the end that nobody liked, and nobody wanted them. It's so cruel. Nobody wanted them on their team. Well, they went through son after son after son, and then in comes little David, and God said, that's the one that I want in my team. I don't see things the way the world sees them. I don't look for the biggest boys. I don't look for the best boys. I look for my boy. Because he is a man after my own heart. And David was anointed and appointed to be the new king. But not just yet. There was some waiting. And so while he waited, he served the king's soul in humility. But he also served his dad, tending the flock of sheep. They belong to the family. And that's where we find David today in this turning point. Because today, I've been asked to preach about David and Goliath. Isn't that a great story? And it's in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And so here we see David waiting on his appointment. It's kind of like he'd been appointed as king, but his coronation hadn't come. He was waiting for his moment. He was waiting for God's timing. And so his father said, David, there's a battle happening right now. The Philistines and the Israelites are going to have a fight. And they were gathered on a hill. It's kind of like Gladiator or Lord of the Rings or even better, Braveheart. (laughs) Without the blue faces. The two armies were on different sides of the field and they were ready to fight. 
And David was sent by his dad to the front line and said, go and take your big brothers some food for the battle. And that is the point where for the first time in his life, David encounters Goliath. That name that would be synonymously linked to David for all of time. He met for the first time and he saw this shouting, mocking, taunting, 10 foot tall giant whom all of Israel was terrified. But David, the shepherd boy, David, the worship leader, David wasn't scared. In fact, David was indignant. He was so annoyed that this heathen would mock the Lord. And he was a bit annoyed at the rest of Israel that nobody would fight him. So David said, I'll fight him. I'll take him on. And he was taken to Saul, the king. And Saul said, you can't possibly fight that guy. He's going to eat you alive. And David said, I, I've fought bears. I've fought lions. I can fight him. So Saul says, well, let's put my armor on. And he puts Saul on this heavy armor. He gives him a heavy sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the, Lord, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you all into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone, the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sharem road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistines' head and brought it into Jerusalem. He put the Philistines' weapons in his own tent. As Saul watched David go out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this young man? Abner says, as sure as you live, your majesty, I don't know. The king said, find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, David still holding the Philistine's head. Amen. That's exciting, isn't it? You can always imagine it. It's almost like the best movie. Can you imagine that being done by Hollywood? Three things I want to talk about this morning in relation to the story. Number one. I want us to think about stepping out of the shadow and into our destiny. You see, David had a destiny. God had already ordained it. God had already anointed him. But he was in a waiting time. What do we do when we're in a time of waiting? Nothing. Complain. Get dis discontented. Or, or discouraged. No, we humble ourselves, we serve, we continue to do what God has asked us to do, and we trust God until our moment arrives. Yeah, David was still in the shadow of Saul, but he was about to walk out, step out of the shadows, and step into his destiny. So what about you? What has God spoken over your life? What has God called you to what is God asking you to wait for? Well, stay faithful. Continue to trust. Stay humble. Serve and wait. And when the time is right, God will advance you to the front and you'll step into your destiny. You see, when it's God's timing, he will make it happen. Not a moment before, not a moment too late. And remember this though. When your time does come, not everybody around you is going to love it. Early on in the story, when David arrived with the food for his big brothers, his older brother said, what are you doing here? And when David volunteered to fight Goliath, he said, you are so full of your own importance. Who do you think you are? 
And even Saul, whom David saved Saul's bacon. Saul was so fiercely jealous that he made David his enemy and desired to kill him time after time. Popularity and God's anointing do not always go together. But faithfulness is required of those who seek to follow the Lord. I want to say to somebody today, your time is coming. Your time is coming. Get ready. Get prepared and then go in God's power and in God's anointing when the time of your call finally comes. Second thing I want to say this morning and think about is facing our giants and bringing them down. Not only was David's destiny standing in front of him, so was this ugly big 10 foot tall giant terrifying the life out of everybody I've been in ministry for over 40 years and I can tell you that every time we walk into our destiny, every time we walk towards what God has for us, we will always encounter giants. As we walk in God's way, giants will always seek to block our path. They will shout, threaten and terrify us. They will mock God. They will mock our plans. They'll tell us, you, you... You're too small. You're too weak. You can't do this. Who said you could do that? You're not capable. You're not big enough. You're not strong enough. You're not good enough. And they'll look so big. And they'll shout so loud. And we might feel tiny before them. But here's some advice. Don't look at your giants through the eyes of fear. Look at them through the eyes of faith. Don't see them from our perspective because they do look big. See them from God's perspective where they are kind of small. And remember, the battle is the Lord's. And if you didn't know, God doesn't lose battles. Growing up, we had this thing we kind of did at school when somebody was, was being mouthy and aggressive and threatening and it would end up with, well, my dad's bigger than your dad. Did you ever do that? Did you ever say that? Well, my dad was actually six foot five. And he was bigger than most dads. So usually when I said that, I was kind of right. My dad, he was called Big Jim and I was Wee Jim. <laughs> my mom was five foot one. My dad was six, six foot five. It's an incredible. And I landed right in the middle, about five foot nine. But whenever I was under, under threat, I knew that I had a great big dad. Well, guess what? See, and our dad's bigger than you. Guess what, giant? Our dad's bigger than your dad. Our father is God Almighty. You see, with human eyes, all of the Israelites, they saw a giant that was way too big to kill. But David, he saw a target that was way too big to miss. He realized that God had put in front of him something that was so obvious that God was going to do it for him. So what's your giant? What is your giant today? Is it fear? It may be sickness. It may be failure. It may be sin in your life. It may be a person, a situation. It may be a past trauma. Whatever your giant is, it blocks you from God's path. Don't let it paralyze you. Don't let it keep you from God's best. Here's what David did when facing his giant. And I encourage you to do the same. Firstly, size up your giant and then choose your weapon carefully. David looked Goliath up and down and he spotted his weak point. You see, all his body was covered with heavy armor. He had a huge big sword, but his big forehead was exposed. Now the thing about being a 10 foot giant means you're going to have a big hit. <laughs> and he had a big exposed forehead. And for David, he just saw a bullseye. That's why he didn't need Saul's weapons. He needed the weapon that he, he was used to. The one that God had gifted him in. He knew that would do the job. And our weapons, our weapons are prayer. 
praise and God's word in front of your giant speak the name of Jesus the name above all other names there is no other name and even this morning we mentioned the name and we mention it again of cancer cancer fear depression sickness death these are names but Jesus is the name above all names and even if they get hold of us, they do not ultimately defeat us because nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So in the end, Satan, we win. We win. When we speak the name of Jesus, it defeats the enemy and hits him right between the eyes. Right in a weak spot. Because he can't resist Jesus' name. He can't resist Jesus' blood. Oh, these are not the weapons of the world. They're heavenly weapons that God has put in our hands and they will be enough to, sh to slay any giant. Mm -hmm. Second thing is, speak to your giant and tell him what's coming. David said, oh, you come at me with spears and swords and javelins, but I come in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, the God of the angel armies. Declare your victory before it happens. Again, pray, praise, and proclaim. And all the times that we have been in ministry, Maggie and I have developed a habit of prayer, praise, and proclamation. And when we are challenged, we pray and we praise and we proclaim. We speak God's word to the situation. We speak God's word to our heart. And we speak God's word into what is to come. And over the years, I have memorized many, many passages of Scripture. And when I need them, I have them. You can't take money out of the bank that you've never first deposited. And I love every week that some of the kids, quite often little Hannes, knows God's Word because he's memorized it. Hannes, brother, never stop doing that. Remember God's Word. And as a pastor, I've stood at the side of beds and, and stood at the side of graves and stood in situations where people were grieving and mourning. And I knew in my heart I could see Psalm 46, God is a refuge and strength and ever-present help in time of trouble. And in a time of danger, God is our protector. And underneath are his everlasting arms. Every time I go onto an aeroplane, which is a lot of times, or every time I get into a car in India, <laughs> or a couple of times I've gone onto a roller coaster with my kids. I say Psalm 121, the Lord will keep me from all harm. He'll watch over my coming and going now and forevermore. Yesterday I was on a plane coming from Manchester and I got it we got an announcement, the kind of announcements you don't really enjoy hearing. Hey, this is your captain. We're going to go into um, a period of strong turbulence in the next 10 minutes. Now I fly about 70 times a year and I'm fine with flying but nobody enjoys turbulence 10 minutes so I'm sitting no, it's coming soon I'm writing, writing my sermon I thought you know it's going to be a real inconvenience and I just said well I'm going to put my sermon to practice thank you Jesus you're going to calm this storm 10 minutes comes and goes nothing's happened 15 minutes nothing's happened I promise you this is verbatim true the pilot said by some miracle, we seem to have missed that turbulence. I went, yes, Jesus! If only the rest of the plane would have known. They'd, they'd be buying me coffee and chocolates when we get off the plane. But we speak into being things that God has promised us will come. Yeah, we're going to get turbulence, but be still and know that I am God. Let your giant know what the outcome is going to be. That Jesus Christ is Lord and you will bow before him. And the last thing is when you bring your giant down, cut off his head. Make no mistakes. Don't just stun him or knock him out. Kill it once and for all. And final point of this morning, number three is, knowing what you carry into the battle with you. When God calls you forward and a battle faces you, when a giant stands in your way, remember the battle is not actually yours. The battle is the Lord's. And that's good. Because as I said earlier, God doesn't lose battles. 
And you don't have to rely on your own gifts or your own strengths. You see, David had killed lions and bears, but that wasn't going to win this battle. He was going to kill the giant in the name and on the promises of God. With his name, and when God's honor is on the line, he'll do the fighting for you, and he'll bring you through. No weapon formed against you will prosper. The enemy may come against you in one direction, but he'll flee in seven. You're not the victim of a giant. Somebody hear that today. Your past, your trauma. You're not a victim of a giant. You're a victor in Jesus. You will not be overwhelmed. You will overcome. Even what the enemy means for evil, God will turn it for his good. For your good and for his glory. Because if the Lord is on your side, victory is not just possible, it's inevitable. You see, you and God are always a winning majority in any battle. And it's a partnership of faith and trust. God does what only God can do. But here's what he asks of us. Take the next step forward in faith. David had to run towards the giant. God doesn't just say, can I wait there? And he's coming towards you. I'll trip him up. And when he falls down, you can cut. He said, you run towards him and you take it on. The battle is mine, but you're my instrument. And we'll go together and we'll win this fight. Walk with God in your battle. Face your giants and see the glory of the Lord transform the terror before you to the triumph behind you. That's what our God does. And I believe that's God's word for us from 1 Samuel this morning. That we can see in our lives as we enact faith, the word, through prayer and praise and trust in God. Let's just pray together.